Hey guys, what's up? This is Chad Haig here in southern India. I'd like to do a series of videos on the philosophy of pentilingual law in the book Can Life Prevail? A very important collection of essays from one of the great thinkers alive today, and I will be doing more than one video, but I want to start the series today with a discussion of deep ecology, overpopulation, and the critique of democracy. These are issues which uh, Linkle is already uh, fairly notorious for holding very controversial views on, but one thing which has not been given adequate attention, uh, which we will discuss in this video, is the properly philosophical reason why, the properly epistemological reason why. And before we start, I'd like to uh, mention that if you if you enjoy uh, this discussion of Linkle, uh, as well as my videos on uh, Kaczynski, Greer, and Zerzan, I'd recommend you to check out my upcoming book, The Hermeneutics of Ecological Limitation, The Philosophy of Post-Environmentalist Memology, uh, available on Amazon soon, where I will discuss all of these thinkers and uh, also address the uh, need to break out of environmentalism. We live in a very weird situation now where the very same people who are destroying the environment are environmentalists. If you took a poll of uh, Democrat Party politicians, um, CEOs, Hollywood celebrities, even corporate employees, um, they, most of them will say, yeah, I'm an environmentalist because it effectively means nothing except that you love nature. And of course, you're never going to accomplish anything unless you break out of that. And one of the few thinkers who's doing that at a significant level is Linkoli, as we will discuss right now. So um, the uh, book Can Life Prevail is a collection of essays by Finnish fisherman and eco-philosopher Penti Linkola, who is primarily known for having a radical stance against human overpopulation, and even more controversially for suggesting that democracy is never going to lead to uh, you lead to a pathway for a serious response to this, because democracy actually doesn't even make sense on rational grounds alone. Dem Democracy might be dressed up in euphemisms like everyone is equal under the law, or everybody has equal access to education and career advancement and things like that, even though that's not actually true, we say it is. But democracy really just means that we're all the same. But he's one of the thinkers, uh, one of the few thinkers with the guts to say that doesn't even make sense rationally. We're not all the same. In fact, on ecological grounds alone, many humans are not are either indifferent in their existence or are outright harmful in their existence to the earth, as I will discuss in this video. So he's one of the only public figures with the guts to acknowledge that the only way to actually take serious action is to bypass the democratic political procedures altogether. What you would have to do instead is install some powerful authority which would enforce things like a decline in global population, a decline in economic growth. This is controversial, a decline in immigration. Now, if you, if you just keep in mind that the United Kingdom already imports something like 80% of its food, you'll notice that um, the United Kingdom is, is basically a lifeboat that has already long since broken the fire code. And on ecological rather than ideological grounds alone, that just, it doesn't make sense to um, argue um, that uh, a situation like that cannot be challenged. So there's a number of other unspeakably controversial issues uh, which they would have to enforce, as I will discuss in this video, and they would do it through the Green Police. This is um, a, a, a group that would enforce these in the face of widespread public disapproval and uh, even in the face of unpopularity, they would remain committed to this. And he says that this is the only way you're actually going to have a serious response. So the reason he's able to say things which would seem unthinkable and unspeakable to somebody who is, say, a professional journalist within the media, a professional uh, professor within the academic industry, is that he did not spend his life within any sort of institution like that. Rather, than be a quote-unquote professional intellectual, he worked as a traditional fisherman. And by that I mean he used an old-fashioned boat for fishing and he sold his goods from a traditional non-fossil fuel-based car. He also lived in a traditional house with no running water, does not use a computer, and he was therefore free from certain institutional constraints which would prevent a careerist from contradicting certain politically correct ideologies, even in cases where the ideology blatantly um, contradicts ecological fact, and that's the real paradox which we have to talk about. So the paradox here is that from a philosophical standpoint, which um, uh, the, the problem with Greer and Kaczynski also noted, um, is that uh, the, the, from a philosophical standpoint, you have to provide an answer for why is it that no matter how much scientific information 
you learn about ecology or impending environmental catastrophes, no amount will ever be enough to bring about even a modest change in behavior. In Kaczynski's 1971 essay, Progress versus Wilderness, he noted that no matter how complicated the system's problem-solving uh, capabilities become, it remains incapable of learning the very simple lesson that it should stop economic growth, even in order to prevent ecological collapse. This failure cannot be blamed on a lack of computing power because it's actually not hard to understand. In fact, even the feeblest human mind can learn what a massive supercomputer cannot. To put it more briefly, the one thing the system can never learn is that it should stop growing. Likewise, in Anti-Tech Revolution decades later, he warns that self-propagating systems will keep advancing until they literally advance into self-destruction. You might argue that Kaczynski's um, seemingly radical calls for revolution against technology actually are epistemologically justified by his realization that the system has no stop button. Therefore, it can only be stopped from the outside by a revolutionary movement of some kind. So this is not merely a problem of AI, to continue with Kaczynski real quick. Kaczynski noted that even self-proclaimed environmentalists have the same problem. Almost always, they have the same consumerist habits as the rest of the population. And this is weird because environmentalists are arguably the people who have willfully exposed themselves to the most scientific information warning them about the consequences of such actions, and yet they literally cannot stop doing it nonetheless. Linkola similarly warned that there's almost no difference between the enlightened and the unenlightened, as the terms he prefers, with one exception. There's a little more chattering to be heard among the enlightened. So in our era, we could say that there's a little more tweeting to be read, and if you look at the Greta Thunberg um, uh, media circus from a few weeks ago. Yeah, there was millions and millions of tweets um, and not much else uh, as a result of uh, directly speaking to the UN. So in its worst form, this chattering uh, becomes what Linkola calls the rustling of papers. This is where bureaucracies have um, uh, vastly overpaid experts earn generous salaries uh, in order to go through the motions of trying to find solutions to these problems. However, the real test, which they always fail, is that in a competition between politically correct ideology and hard ecological reality, the politically correct ideology always wins. Let's consider some of Linkola's own examples to show you why this is the case. So, um, in a refresher course on the state of the world, um, he notes that Finns are actually pretty well educated on the ecological problems on a scientific level. They have a very good educational system there, all that. So, Nonetheless, every bureaucracy within the country is unanimously committed to one thing, and that is preventing an economic recession. Preventing recession, however, cannot honestly be described as anything except a euphemism for making the same crisis worse, because economic growth and environmental damage cannot be separated. They're actually the same thing. So the only meaningful test for whether someone actually cares about these issues or merely pretends to is whether they will adopt the supremely unpopular stance of willfully bringing about an economic depression. Obviously, this is never going to be done through economic uh, through democratic means, because I don't know about you, I have never heard a candidate run on the campaign promise of bringing about a depression. One's only option would be to establish a strong authority that forcefully stops economic growth in order to serve higher ecological goals. If one fails to do so, you must be reminded, the long-term damage will easily negate whatever little, mostly meaningless benefits were gained from short-term growth anyway. So a consciously engineered recession is far from the only example of how somebody can only be taken seriously if they're willing to adopt unpopular and, to most people, unthinkable stances. Ironically enough, the stances themselves are completely unproblematic on scientific grounds. It's only on ideological level that they seem objectionable. For example, the scientific data alone are enough for one to conclude that house cats should be banned from Finland. In Cat Disaster, he notes that cats are not native to Finland anyway. They're a foreign predator imported from Egypt. On ecological grounds alone, they simply do not belong in Finland. This is because cats' natural tendency is to hunt, and specifically to hunt birds. But that has proved devastating in attempts to keep certain native bird populations from tipping into the endangered zone. Even if the bureaucracies invest lots of time and money and energy into trying to stabilize these populations, um, house cats go hunting in the morning, easily negate whatever effort they uh, invested into that. So even the argument that cats should only be used to kill the bad animals like mice is flawed. Because mice might be annoying to humans, but they still play a vital role within the ecosystem. To argue that their disappearance would not matter is something that uh, you could only argue if you have no idea about how the ecological um, 
reality of the situation works. So, um, while we're on the topic of unthinkably controversial proposals, how about the most unthinkable of all too many people? The end of modern sanitation. Um, this is something I can already hear people go, ew, thinking about it. But um, Kaczynski and Greer have written what few people want to hear, which is the rise of um, autoimmune disorders was precisely because of historically unprecedented levels of sanitation. Um, Kaczynski has written about how um, in older times, um, children routinely would get, um, uh, what's the word for it? They would get diarrhea, uh, which now we spare them from that experience through over-sanitation. But it was an experience which made their immune systems much stronger as adults. And this is something you see still in so-called third world countries. Um, uh, I can't think of anybody in the world with better immune systems than slum dwellers in the third world. They have really good immune systems precisely because um, the children still have that experience. And unfortunately, there's a certain number of children in India and Egypt who, who die uh, from the, uh, the diarrhea experience. Uh, but on ecological grounds alone, what happens if you don't have that is uh, an immune system that basically doesn't function. So Linkel is living proof of this, um, living proof that the kind of outrageous levels of over-sanitation practiced in the restaurant industry in the U.S. are unnecessary to somebody with a normal functional immune system. He notes himself in Finland Humbug that he doesn't throw out moldy bread or moldy jam. He eats it and he's okay because he has a normal immune system. In the United States, however, if you've worked in the uh, restaurant industry, you'll know that um, in this image here, um, on the uh, right-hand side of this, uh, you'll see the um, uh, bottle of concentrated uh, um, chemical, which uh, is uh, diluted with a solution in the sink, and everything is just soaked in this sanitizer solution. And that is not natural. And by the way, it also has economic consequences um, because enforcing ridiculous regulations where you have to keep food at exactly the right temperature for the exactly the right time and facilities clean with exactly the right level of artificial chemicals, it's effectively made it impossible for anyone except major corporations to produce food. And that's, that's exactly what they want. Old fashioned fishermen in Finland, for example, violated all of these rules, the temperature rules, the sanitation rules, everything. Um, because each one of those is simply a euphemism for fossil fuels, modern technology, and lots of money. Ironically enough, all of us just got sicker, however, as a result of enforcing precisely these same rules. And by the way, many people lost their livelihood and were forced either into unemployment or to become slaves for these same companies. So it's a lose-lose situation. Oh, and by the way, the ecological consequences are horrific. So Linkle has had the guts to criticize um, the Finnish law making it illegal to drown cats, which was a normal procedure for generations. Um, when it was necessary, you would drown a cat. Now you can go to jail for that. Of course, removing cats from the ecosystem where they don't belong will likely involve violence at some level. He compares cats, in fact, to dingoes in Australia. That was an invasive species which devastated the local ecosystem, which it did not belong in. And the only ethical response is violence. You have to kill them. And arguably even more deserving of violence than cats is the mink, an invasive predator which has devastated local wildlife populations in Finland. Ted Kaczynski has similarly known that one of the most ridiculous contradictions of our era is the idea that an environmentalist movement should be committed to opposing all forms of violence. Few things are quite as natural, however, as violence. In fact, if there was no violence in nature, the prey would quickly eat up everything and destroy the ecosystem for everyone. Likewise, Linkola adopts the politically incorrect stance, <coughs> excuse me, arguing that minks should be forcibly, uh, forcefully, violently exterminated before they destroy the ecosystem. Once again, this is not controversial on scientific ecological grounds. It's only on ideological grounds that you should not kill a cute animal that it would seem problematic. How about we venture into the most heretical territory of all, even more, unnecessary, even more necessary than recession, reduction of sanitation, and the extermination of cats and minks is the following. How about the end of technology? Modern technology, I mean. What has technology actually done except cause us to lose a connection with our own freaking bodies? Think about this. The human body is submitted to a type of um, uh, process of interpretation where it literally becomes a hermeneutical object of understanding through traditional forms of serious labor. So this is my idea um, explicitly this form in, in the book I'm writing right now. Uh, but you can find this in Kaczynski as well, the idea that um, 
normal paths for the power process where you have to actually produce your own food, you have to locate water, you have to keep yourself safe. Those are processes that are natural, both psychologically and physically. You only really understand your own body if you have to adopt those forms. But with uh, modern technology um, controlling access to food, water, shelter, all of that, you're left with these stupid surrogate activities like cheering for a football team or, you know, um, collecting uh, what's it, collecting Britney Spears albums or something, I don't know, who knows. Um, but um, those actually disconnect you from your body. And automation for Linkula has actually brought about something of an alienation from our own bodies. Deprived of the very ability to work, the body has deteriorated physically. The mind has suffered with boredom and purposelessness. And by the way, the ecological consequences are horrific. Still, nobody within the politically correct bureaucracies would ever dream of challenging automation. Oh wait, I mean technology. Rather, the surest pathway to secure funding and generate enthusiasm is to claim that some fancy new machine will alleviate the problems caused by fancy new machines. Interestingly, even um, uh, things like pastimes have become intrinsically more expensive as a result. He said that in his own childhood, um, you know, pastimes certainly existed, but they were not expensive. Compare this with the enormous cost just to have fun today. See, kids don't even ride bicycles today. Now, even that is too primitive. You have to have more and more expensive ways to have fun. However, the cost goes up as the satisfaction goes down. Alienation grows just as ecological catastrophe becomes inevitable. However, even the emphasis on um, how machines can be coordinated with us risks missing the point that we are not necessary to this anyway. Um, like Kaczynski, Linkola warns that humans are not at all in control of this process because there's a natural teleological orientation for us to disappear from it. So, um, in the intolerable misfortune of technology, uh, the following quote is worth reading in full. Through all of these technological accomplishments and celebrated innovations, man has made himself useless. We have successfully been obliterating the roles of producer, which we no longer have, transporter, distributor, serviceman. When we also rid ourselves of the role of consumer, everything will be over except clanking of robots for some time, and then after that, only deep silence. However, um, no one is allowed to cross the sacred boundary to utter the two blasphemous words, no machines, even if no humans comes first. So what about veganism? It's currently fashionable among some Western elites to claim that the real solution um, is just for everyone to go 100% vegan. That's a sort of um, easy way out of um, dealing with all of the other things I mentioned, sanitation, um, cats, technology. No, 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 it's just diet. It's just everyone has to go 100% vegan. Of course, two parents in Australia were recently arrested when their 19-month-old daughter was so malnourished from a vegan diet that she could barely function. Still, it's much easier to save vegan salads than no machines or kill the cats. On purely ecological grounds, however, this alone, uh, uh, on purely ecological grounds alone, however, this also makes no sense. Human overpopulation was driven by grain surpluses which were in turn driven by fossil fuels. You cannot put the blame for that on traditional fishermen like Linkolum. Also, anybody who actually does hard physical labor, such as fishing, farming, etc., will know the body requires meat to do so. Forcing peasants to farm on a diet of oatmeal, apples, and bananas might mean death for the poor. Oh, by the way, much of the geography of the earth is unfit, unfit for vegetable gardening anyway, but it is fit as pasture for livestock. That's why the uh, diets of certain areas in Central Asia are very uh, meat heavy because that's the ecological consequence of that um, environment. So back to overpopulation. Of course, Linkola is most notorious for adopting what is considered an extreme stance on human overpopulation. He has warned that democratic political processes will never provide a pathway for serious solutions. Um, and this naturally follows from the epistemological problem we have dealt with all lecture. You can never enact changes through learning theoretical information. Likewise, he has suggested that we implement unpopular tough measures such as restrictions on immigration, on, um, on, on births and things like that. Contrary to expectation, the madness of overpopulation is not merely a right-wing or left-wing problem. He calls, of course, the right-wing pro-life movement collective mental illness. But he also attacks liberal opposition to, to the death penalty since even the most diabolical of criminals are forced to live forever in prison under political correctness where you cannot kill anyone. These are all, <coughs> however, founded on the same humanistic ideological chimera, the unique irreplaceable individual. Once again, in a competition between scientific ecological fact and politically correct ideology, which one do you think democratic uh, processes and 
professional bureaucrats will choose.